so uh, I'm David Skilling, now based in Singapore, uh, working uh, for a, a bunch of governments, the New Zealand government, uh, Singapore government, and, uh, and doing writings. Most of my focus now is on small countries, uh, trying to establish why they've done uh, well or not, and why they have done uh, uh, as they have. And one of my observations is that small countries uh, understand that they need to uh, act in a fairly deliberate way to engage with the world. Uh, the outside world for a small country uh, matters a great deal because they've got a small uh, domestic market. Um, but they're also, which is, uh, you know, got a series of positives that you can engage, but also expose yourself to more risks. You have to think hard about how you're going to be distinctive uh, and to succeed. And so my observation of small countries, many of whom have done uh, very well, for Singapore's and Northern Europeans, is that uh, to varying extents and in different ways, they all have formed a perspective on how it is they're going to engage the world. They have a sense of shared purpose around uh, direction, not necessarily formalised in written documents, but there's a sense of their place in the world, uh, how the world is changing and how it's going to affect them uh, and how they're going to, uh, to respond. Uh, when I contrast the small country experience with uh, my observations of New Zealand, um, both drawing on my time uh, here, commenting on the New Zealand experience and now uh, sitting in, in Singapore, uh, New Zealand looks uh, distinct in, in several ways. One, uh, you know, obviously our performance is not that great, so we're one of the uh, worst performing uh, small countries. We've done okay, but not as well as uh, many of the others. Um, but there's a few features um, of New Zealand that look uh, uh, different. One is that we seem uh, remarkably introspective uh, as a country. Uh, most small countries uh, think hard about the outside world because they have to. Uh, New Zealand, I think in large part because we are physically uh, isolated from the rest of the world, uh, doesn't uh, do that to the same extent. We kind of vaguely know what's going on uh, out there and exports do matter for our economy. Uh, but most of our policy debates, most of our national debate uh, is framed in terms of domestic issues and domestic considerations uh, and thinking very much about us. So it's an inward looking um, uh, sort of conversation which I think is, is quite distinctive. The second uh, aspect that I think is, uh, is different is that we don't seem to have a shared view of uh, where we are in the world and how a changing world affects us and how we ought to, uh, to respond. So the absence of strategic intent uh, about what we do uh, is quite striking uh, as well. And I think in the context of a world that is changing uh, quite disruptively uh, and in ways that I think are quite challenging for small countries, uh, multilateralism is weakening, volatility is increasing, it's a much more competitive world. Uh, small countries have to work a lot harder uh, than they have and I think uh, bringing that back to New Zealand that poses some challenges for us as well uh, and although we uh, at least publicly talk a big game about China, emerging markets, uh, Asia, uh, commodity prices, uh, you know being in the right part of the world at the right time all of which is well, it's not untrue but it's not as true as we uh, often claim it to be uh, and New Zealand, I think, does need to think hard and quite urgently about how it is that we're going to respond, uh, what investments we're going to make, how we're going to be distinctive, how we manage the risks uh, that face us, both economic and political and, and, uh, uh, and other. Um, and that requires some process of collective decision making. Uh, and New Zealand has been bad at collective decision making for a while. We've got a perfectly well functioning uh, democracy, but we don't have an ability to it seems, to develop a shared point of view on what we want to do. Then many of these conversations end up uh, uh, going around in, in endless loops. So it's not that we're doing things terribly badly. Uh, the economy is doing reasonably well compared to many others in, in, in Europe and we have uh, some uh, positive forces that are helping us, uh, Asia and commodity prices as, as I mentioned. Uh, but it seems to me we need to do a lot better and we need to have a much more coherent and structured view of, uh, of how we're going to position ourselves in, in a world uh, that I think is becoming less and less uh, benign for us. Uh, well, I, mean, I think in a sense it's a pretty obvious answer for a country like New Zealand. Uh, we're small and remote and at the same time that Tom Friedman was writing uh, his book about the world is flat, the use of technology and new business models meant that economic activity could be uh, undertaken uh, anywhere. 
the experience uh, from a New Zealand perspective was, well, yes, but all of our companies and people are leaving. Uh, head offices are relocating to Sydney, people are going to uh, Asia or Europe, uh, or the US particularly, the, the, the more highly skilled ones, but even uh, just you know, tradespeople and, and regular um, uh, people in regular occupations going to, uh, going to Australia. Uh, why? Partly it's, uh, it's income, um, but that's, um, you know, that's kind of a high level observation. You know, what's driving income differential? It's well, in cities and larger uh, areas, productivity is higher, incomes are higher, career opportunities are higher. Uh, and if you look at the pattern of economic activity globally, uh, it's becoming more and more concentrated in large areas, uh, the New Yorks, the Londons, the Silicon Valleys, the Shanghais, the Singapores. Uh, so this notion that we're going to live in a very distributed world and you can do whatever you want from wherever you want, uh, you know, is not true. It's, it's lumpy. Economic activity is, is lumpy. There are distinct um, sort of spikes around uh, agglomeration. So, yes, it's the case that, uh, you know, high-speed broadband and, uh, and, and sort of uh, improved transportation technology make it easier for us to get to market, but it makes it easier for everybody to get to market. And it turns out that if you are, a, for example, a software firm, um, and, you know, it's the marginal cost of getting your product, um, which is a weightless product, to the market is effectively zero once you've created a thing. Um, where do you choose to locate yourself? Well, it turns out you choose to locate yourself where there's a critical mass of people, the skills, the environment, the research infrastructure, the universities and the like. Uh, and so that tends, not exclusively, but tends to be in larger uh, areas unless there's you know, a small university town or there's some history uh, around it. So, you know, there are opportunities for New Zealand to exploit um, in the weightless economy. Uh, it, it is one way of overcoming the tyranny of distance, but that's uh, an absolute improvement. It doesn't close the relative gap. Everyone's benefiting from this, and some, uh, I'd argue, are benefiting disproportionately. I think it's also important to note that even though claims are often made that the tyranny of distance from a New Zealand perspective is reducing because the world is coming closer to us. I think we've got to be a little bit careful about uh, how we interpret those claims, having just flown in from Singapore, which is a ten and a half hour flight. Ten and a half hours is not nothing, that's still quite a long uh, distance to fly. Um, and if you go to, to Delhi or, uh, or, or Beijing, it's a little bit further uh, again. So. It's not on our doorstep, it's closer. Um, but the other aspects, it's not just a physical game, it's a, uh, it's a more qualitative process as well. The other dimensions of distance are cultural and linguistic and you know, understanding of markets and the like. And uh, these emerging markets, being Asia or Latin America, uh, tend to be more different than the markets that we have traditionally uh, been used to, uh, the European markets, North American market, uh, and, and so on. So distance is not uh, dead, the world is lumpy and that poses real challenges for small remote economies like New Zealand. None of it's intended to be a message of fatalism. Uh, there are ways to, uh, if not fully overcome, at least to mitigate and deliberately respond to some of those, some of those pressures, but the, the key is that needs to be a deliberate process. Uh, if you adopt the view uh, that the world is flat, uh, that all we need to do is provide a you know, low-cost, efficient, stable environment and resources will flock here. I mean, I think the experience of the last 15 years is that it just doesn't happen. Not just in New Zealand, but as a more general proposition, you don't see that type of behaviour. So, in a lumpy world, it's not flat, it's more competitive. Uh, it's additional reason for New Zealand to step up and really figure out where are we going to invest, uh, what are the key areas in which we're going to be distinctive, and frankly, why should people or companies or capital uh, choose to locate in New Zealand versus uh, anywhere else in the world that they could choose to locate. So New Zealand is, is small uh, and remote, so benchmarking New Zealand against other small countries is uh, fair at, at one level, because it's the most obvious group that you compare it to, but you know, also misses something where we're small and, and distant. So um, if you think about uh, you know, the level of external engagement of some of these other small countries, uh, yes, they think hard, they've got um, you know, both a government and, and, and private sector, they've got deep engagement with uh, the countries in their region, uh, and, and beyond, but that's off a base where they're in a flow of ideas and networks and relationships. If you're a small European country, you're surrounded by Europe and it's in your newspapers and you speak seven languages and it's just, you're, you're in the flow. Similarly, uh, if you're in Singapore or Hong Kong, you're in the flow of, uh, of Asia in a way that we're not. Yes, we can uh, go online or read it in the newspapers, but it's not the same as being there and in the same networks. And, uh, you know, technology, wonderful though it is, um, you know, Skype, Facebook, Twitter, all of those things, uh, tend to reinforce existing relationships uh, and there's no evidence at all that business travel has been 
treated as a substitute or has been substituted for by uh, video conferencing or teleconferencing, bear an aid. Uh, but these forms of communications technology uh, uh, you know, build on existing social, personal or business uh, relationships. And so when I talk about New Zealand having to over-invest in our um, external presence and our external relationships, it's because we don't have the uh, sort of natural benefit that some of these other small countries have of just being in the flow. Uh, and that's still a, very much a distance thing. You know, if you're across the border from a large country, it's easy. Or um, in Singapore is, is a hub there are people coming through all the time, um, companies from around the world located there. So it's very easy to figure out what's happening, what are the new ideas, what are people talking about, uh, in a way that's less common in, in New Zealand. Uh, so finding ways to deliberately plug New Zealand into those networks, um, either by travelling uh, more, more actively, uh, investing in relationships and networks or uh, bringing uh, people back through New Zealand to have, you know, have seminars, workshops, uh, lecture series, those sort of things. Um, you know, countries like Singapore, many of the European countries do that very actively. Uh, they're conscious they're small and they need to be uh, engaged. I think that's even more so for a country like New Zealand that doesn't have those natural benefits. Uh, and so determining that we are going to make a serious uh, investment in our uh, private and public sector international engagement strikes me as uh, enormously important. Why I came? Well, I, I don't turn down requests from uh, Sir Paul. Uh, I thought it was um, the framing, at least as it was explained to me, was was interesting. So, uh, you know, in part it gave me an excuse to talk about something that I wanted to talk about for a while. So that this notion of uh, the birth of uh, sort of modern slash European New Zealand, so um, post dating. Um, you know, the arrival of, of Cook for the transit of Venus in 1769, uh, at a period of world history when uh, there was unprecedented activity intellectually, uh, the economic space, philosophically, scientifically, the Industrial Revolution, Declaration of Independence, French Revolution, uh, wealth of nations, the whole uh, Western world was going through considerable turmoil. That was exactly the same time that New Zealand was being uh, sealed by Europeans, the Treaty of Waitangi was being, uh, was being signed. And so that, to me, is a really interesting historical observation that you know, deep in New Zealand's modern DNA is a sense of international connectedness, that we were being uh, born as a modern country with, with, in the European settlement at the same time as the Western world was being uh, born. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, New Zealand, it seems to me, doesn't have that uh, degree of connection to international debates. We're not the international flow of ideas to the same extent. Um, and so it seems to me, one, that's an incredibly important thing um, to remember uh, and that we need to seriously find ways of overcoming this introspective debate and plugging New Zealand uh, into these um, uh, sort of international flows of ideas and people uh, and, and the like. But also it flows the other way of ideas can reach us at the ends of the earth from the other side of the world as James Cook did in 1769 but it seems to me that the same principle operates in reverse which is um, you know, it would be nice if New Zealand's ideas impacted on the rest of the world, both for our commercial advantage, uh, but also in the context of being a good global citizen and developing a reputation for ideas uh, and innovation and creativity uh, and, and, and the like. So New Zealand uh, used to be called a laboratory of the world. I think that's got much less purchase now because um, we haven't actually come up with any new or good ideas for a while. But women's suffrage, social insurance, the treaty settlement process, all of those were big ideas that were internationally renowned, international interests, people uh, be the path to Wellington. That doesn't happen anymore, but you know, as a country on the edge, unconstrained, reasonably young, uh, the, the notion of New Zealand uh, from the ends of the earth operating as an intellectual insurgent, generating new ideas, uh, stroke is a really interesting idea. So I was, um, uh, when I was uh, asked to come, I was very happy to say uh, yes and accept the invitation. So, so this is a, a good platform for starting that kind of conversation um, because to me one of the most consequential things we can do um, as a country is re-engaging much more del deliberately and much more seriously with uh, the world outside. Yes there are domestic policy levers from infrastructure to education to, to science policy to all manner of things that we need to do uh, here but that needs to be done in the context of an understanding of the world out there and making sure that it's a very porous border between domestic uh, and international. So I agreed uh, to, to Sir Paul's uh, request as I um, saw it as a good opportunity to start having those kind of conversations.